But anyway, but thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, and I think the, the main news is those huskies um, haven't been put down, um, and I think they're about to bite back. Um, there is a um, clear commitment within the Conservative Party to the wider, broader green agenda. Um, I think the media constantly underestimate the uh, strong support that there is across the parliamentary party for the agenda which David Cameron very clearly articulated uh, in opposition, which is a, a foundation of his um, modernisation of the Conservative Party, and which in government we have been very uh, workmanlike in putting into place. Um, there is a broad range of really quite profound change going on through legislation, through policy, through spending priorities, which actually have underpinned the delivery of the promises that we made in opposition and the commitment that David Cameron made on day three of becoming Prime Minister when he came to DEC and said he wanted this to be the greenest government ever. The challenge, I think, now is us to put our mouth where our money is. Um, they, we need to come up with a more um, compelling narrative that is right for the times because simply trotting out the old mantra that may have looked good in 2008 six when we went to, to um, Svalbard, as you said, Geoffrey, isn't good enough. Um, I can understand that people are concerned about costs, about value for money, about the impact on consumer bills, about how an environment, an aggressive, ambitious environmental agenda fits into um, a very um, uh, straightened times with a, with, a, with a very, very serious um, deficit reduction strategy um, and a focus on value for money and and uh, and cost of living, we have got to show, we um, who passionately believe in this agenda, have got to show not only that we still believe in this stuff, that climate change is important, that the broad, broader green agenda is important, but actually that it is right for the times. And that does mean recalibrating the narrative as well as ensuring that our policies are right. And if you want to start with somewhere to articulate that, there is nowhere better to start than on the energy efficiency agenda. It is a no-brainer. Um, that basically we as Conservatives understand that we should avoid waste, that we should avoid uh, unnecessary uh, extravagance. And that's what burning fossil fuel for heating or electricity is when you don't need it. It's unnecessary extravagance, talking of which, there's a lot of lights in this room. Um, but uh, <laughs> across... <laughs> across <laughs> <laughs> that's the yeah. Um, not, are they? Um, anyway, but um, uh, the, the bottom line is the energy efficiency agenda is a real opportunity for the Conservatives to actually get across this message that actually the green agenda hasn't gone away, it's torter, um, it's leaner, um, but it's certainly more focused uh, on the future and is going to be as big a part of our future as it has been of our recent past. Um, and the launch of the Green Deal, or rather the rollout of the Green Deal in 2013, is going to be key to that. Geoffrey alluded to the fact that on October the 1st, the first part of the legislation went live. It has been confused with a launch. It wasn't the launch. Basically, what happened on October the 1st is that it then became legal for companies to begin getting authorised. Before you can go out and offer the, um, a... a um, a offer to the consumer, you've got to be authorised as a Green Deal provider, um, you've got to be a Green Deal finance provider, you've got to be a Green Deal, you've got to have your Green Deal products um, certified. As a result of the, of the legislation going live on the 1st of October, that process is now happening. That also means that the eco is in place. So actually um, companies can get, begin making plans for spending the very substantial um, subsidy that's effectively available to the private sector, uh, not but not just the uh, energy companies, as was the case under the <coughs> previous regime, but more broadly to a whole range of companies and to local authorities to use this big £1.3 billion pounds a year subsidy um, of eco um, to drive forward the, um, the, the Green Deal agenda. So we took an important step forward on the 1st of October, but it shouldn't be confused with a launch. I want the Green Deal to, to roll out steadily, surely, um, and emphatically as we go through 2013, go through 2014, and 15 and beyond. This isn't a, you know, one of New Labour's flash-in-the-pan uh, announcements. This isn't a short-term 
um, uh, initiative. This isn't a program that's going to come to the end in two years' time like CERT was and will then be extended by another year. This is a program for renewal and change that will last for two decades. Um, and one thing is absolutely sure, we won't have all the answers on day one. And I think uh, if the Labour Party say, oh, you, sh you should do, that we have all the answers, they are not telling the truth. The fact of the matter is, until we see how the consumer responds to this completely new and transformational way of uh, dealing with energy efficiency and wider greening of properties, um, we won't be able to say for sure if we've got the right policy framework in place. And what is absolutely certain is that we will need to come back in future years with additional incentives, potentially additional regulation, just as any company that was launching a new product wouldn't launch, wouldn't invest heavily in its R&D, launch it onto the market and then walk away. We will stick with the Green Deal and we will continue to drive it forward in the light of real-time consumer evidence and behaviour. Um, and I take all of the reports, all of the forecasts um, with a pinch of salt. All I know is that we've got to do it um, and we're absolutely committed to the success of the Green Deal. But your point, Geoffrey, which I really want to um, address uh, before closing, is how are we going to do this given people can't, you know, you can't give away insulation. And that really characterises the misunderstanding of the Green Deal. That is the big misconception that somehow this is CERT 3. Um, this is not the same um, CERT programme, which was basically giving away or flogging very cheaply rolls of insulation to shove in your loft or sending light bulbs through the post. This is about a totally new aspirational agenda where actually loft insulation and small insulation measures are a very small part of a much bigger uh, retrofit of Britain's homes. And what the Green Deal does is for the first time make energy efficiency aspirational. Because the great thing about the Green Deal is it doesn't just deliver the worthy things that people ought to do um, and make sense to do, it actually delivers the things that they actually want in their homes. Um, it doesn't just pr put stuff in the loft out of sight and out of mind. As part of that package, that financeable package, it will also be able to deliver, in the, it potentially, um, a complete, you know, with the support from Eco, it can deliver a completely new fascia for the house. It can have you know, some of the rock wall products that I've seen, absolutely fantastic, that completely make over the front of a house. So really tired 60s, 70s, even 80s um, detached or semi-detached or terraced home, put on um, solid wall insulation, which until very recently was guaranteed to make any home look like something that had been transported from Eric Honecker's East Germany. Actually, now the innovation that there's been in, in these products means that you can actually improve the look, the feel, the value of a home by putting on solid wall insulation on the outside. You can put in um, new LED lighting uh, with a whole range of colours. You can put in sensors, you can put in gadgets, you can put in double glazing. You could get a new front door. You could get guttering to protect the solid wall insulation, to protect the fascia. Um, a whole range of products that actually um, people want that will make a material improvement to their home. And the Green Deal be firmly <coughs> planted not on, the, not on the space of the people who want to green the planet, not on the, on the, with the space of um, people who want to just make one or two uh, smart interventions in their homes, but with a broad instinct of the British people, which is to improve their home. And we know from a whole range of data and sampling that by far the most powerful change agent is that UK aspiration to improve the home. So do not think about the Green Deal as simply how, you know, X many rolls of insulation. It's not even about uh, solid <coughs> um, cavity wall insulation, but a whole range. I think we're now up to 45 different products that can get be, mm. go into the home, and providing they meet the golden rule, um, namely that over over 25 years they um, they will pay for themselves uh, they can be included and it, it'll, it's likely not going to be the cavity wall insulation or the loft insulation that's going to draw people in it will be those new windows it will be the new front door it will be the makeover for the look of the house it, well I want those LED lights that next door have got it is an aspirational agenda if you phone up and ask people who've never seen these things if they want them they'll give you a very clear answer no if you actually show people what they want, so show people what they can do with their homes in a house like theirs, 
in a street like theirs, in a community like theirs, it goes like hot cakes. But you, people have to see it to, be, to believe it, which is why it's really important that um, every local authority encourages show homes in their own area, why we get sort of innovation um, spread right across the country, that people have a chance to see it and experience it and what it would look like a home like theirs. So this is a very ambitious new agenda taking energy efficiency to a whole new level, to a whole new level of aspiration. And I'm afraid if you approach it with a mindset of this is just another CERT program delivered by the big six, you won't begin to understand it. What I'm seeing from the SMEs, what I'm seeing from the people who are actually already in the home improvement business, um, what I'm seeing from people who are offering this um, in social housing and communities is actually there's huge demand for this. But it's a different type of demand and we in, in the green movement have to a, 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 you know, attach ourselves to the much broader movement of home improvement and aspiration and growth in the economy. The Green Deal is a pro-growth policy. It's a pro-growth agenda and that, above all, makes me really confident that it will succeed. Thank you, Greg. Well, you fit me for more cheerful again. Whether I shall, it will survive uh, Guy's operation later on, I don't know. But I'm very much more cheerful than the full time being. Thank you. You always cheer me up. And I must say, I think we were the first house in the country, Philip said we were, to go entirely LED lighting. And um, I must say, I, it was a revelation to me going down to Philip's. We did pay for it, by the way, and see the see see what the LEDs could do. Because here was something that was not only um, saved a lot of energy. But it was a lot more fun yeah. than ordinary lights. And also, the thing about LEDs, Geoffrey, I retrofitted my house <coughs> in 2007 8 with LEDs. And oh. actually, the reality is some of them were a bit horrible. You know, they were, oh, a, bit, they were a bit great. The, the change in quality of light and uh, of a lot of these coaches, even in a matter of months, it's changing all the time. It's really exciting. Well, that, that's what I should have said, because I went down sort of thinking they look like these awful morgue lights that you used to have. And then that's absolutely unbelievable what you can do. Anyway, I won't go into it, so I'm going to be quick. Thomas, I'm sure, has a similar story to tell about, about Rockwell. I, um, and I do have to say, we actually, we did use some Rockwell in the house, but, but not the wall build that we used, and the loft insulation. I knew that. And it was, well, you did, I know. And it was, um, only because I told you it was a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, it, um, it was the, um, um, and I did, we did, in our inquiries, we did find out that, rather surprisingly, perhaps, it has the lowest carbon footprint of any of the sort of artificial not, um, insulation substances. Um, so Thomas is here, he's the Managing Director of the UK and Ireland of Rockwell, he's a Dane, he came from Asia. Uh, Rockwell claims that to be the leading manufacturer of stonewall insulation products, so I asked him if he knew of any, if there were any other manufacturers. He said, last time in Dane, he said there were 450 he knew of, mainly in China, and he knew every one. So here you are, here is a man who knows 450 Chinese makers <coughs> of Rockwell. And I don't think you'll ever have the privilege of being in the room with someone like that before, <laughs> and may never be so again. So make the most of it, Thomas. Thank you very much. And I've actually been drinking with most of them, so... Uh, <laughs> Good God, the mind, the mind truly does boggle the night. Like, like you do in China. Did you get stoned? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I don't have to, to say a lot about uh, Rockwool after this introduction. <laughs> Maybe just one more comment. Uh, Rockwell is the second biggest, the uh, second largest insul insulation manufacturer in the world on a global scale, and I should say the largest on Stonewall. Um, what is much more important for me to tell you is that we're very passionate about energy efficiency, and we consider ourselves a little bit of an expert on building energy efficiency, and very importantly, comfort, because the aspirational element, as Minister has talked about, is very much linked to the comfort of a building, maybe not so much the energy bill. We firmly believe that insulation can make buildings better places to live and to work in, as well as make them cheaper to operate and, of course, greener. Rockwell has been a long-term supporter of the principles behind Green Deal, and we are also a member of the Green Deal financing company. So I'm very delighted to sit next to Minister today, who has really been the driving force behind the Green Deal and Eco programs. And we also had the pleasure earlier this year to host a visit of Minister to our factory in Wales. We have a local manufacturing base in the UK and 400 employees. As um, was said, I'm from Denmark. I've been here a little bit more than one and a half years. 
And when I first came to UK, one of the things that really struck me was the quality of our buildings and the diversity of our buildings. And one of the facts is that more than 60% of the buildings are built before 1990, 19, sorry. So it's no surprise that they have a very poor energy efficiency compared to most other European countries we would like to compare ourselves with. Uh, and this is important because buildings currently account for 40% of the total energy consumption in UK and also 36% of the carbon uh, emissions, the greenhouse gas, gas emissions. So if we want to combat those two issues, we need to make our homes better, more energy efficient, and this of course will also at the same time have a very important impact on the bill we all have to pay for the energy. Despite initiatives from energy companies and governments over the last, let's say, 10 years, uh, it's also a fact that more than half of the, ha the homes in the UK are still having insufficient levels of insulation. When I look at the Green Deal, one of the very critical things I see is to get the public buy-in to Green Deal. We've seen previous programs not reaching those who need uh, the most. For instance, eradicating fuel poverty, and that has to be a goal of what we're also discussing here. Public information campaigns uh, by government is needed to signpost the benefits of the Green Deal to householders and to build consumer confidence that this will work. We see, as Rockwell in other countries, that awareness is key and is really uh, driving, driven sorry, by public campaigns. We understand what is forthcoming. We're very much looking into uh, uh, seeing the details of that one. We also understand that government is looking at cashback style offers to drive Green Deal. And we believe other potential incentives like these would be uh, needed. And we very much hope that, that it would not only be cash back, but also maybe linked to other mechanisms. Um, what we know from other countries, such as Austria, Germany, Scandinavia, is that you get very good uptake of energy efficiency measures by combining the stick and the carrot. That's something that really motivates consumers to take action. So, if we can combine those two things, we have a good chance. But the, right now, at this point in time, the transition to Green Deal is probably our greatest concern. Um, there will be a gap between certain set ending and Green Deal really catching on to the eco. And that will have a potentially uh, negative effect on the consumer engagement that has already been built until now. One last point I'd like to make is that as much as insulation and other energy efficiency measures are important for energy consumption in our homes, we also need to address the consumer behavior. And we need to address the national inertia of changing our behavior. What we saw in Denmark over decades is that government <coughs> ran campaigns telling people to turn down the heat to 21 degrees and explained that comfort is actually linked to 21 degrees. And what we've seen today is that in Denmark, everybody has that temperature in the house. Um, if you look at a study we did recently at a London estate, which underwent a CESP program, in identical apartments, we saw tenants use between 500 pounds per, per year and 2,000 pounds per year for heating more or less the same apartment. That's all down to behavior. This, this report, which is due, due to be launched later this month, <coughs> will uh, demonstrate that there's a huge impact on the energy efficient programs in support of consumer education. We will do a third stage of this study in next year, and we will look at what is coming out of the CES program post re uh, uh, regeneration. One last point. Um, if you look at what happens in Germany at the KFW program, their funding is also made available by government, but it is at interest rates of 2.5%. And that means in Germany, every euro spent on energy retrofit drives back four to five euros into the German economy. In conclusion, Robert very much believes in Green Deal and Eco. We think both are great programs, and what we now need is to deliver these. Thank you. Excellent, Thomas. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, Richard Carmichael seems to be one of these people who attracts jargon. Um, 
his, he's, he is research assistant in the diffusion of innovation on the diffusion of innovation team of the innovative and enterprise group exploring consumer engagement for the low carbon London project. So, yeah, so <laughs> hmm? not surprising he's part of after that is a psychologist. He's an expert in cognitive psych psycholinguistics, whatever that may mean, and in using diversive rhetorical analysis. That means he's got your number, Jeff. I think it probably means something. And it means certainly he's a hell of a lot more cleverer than I am, and I'm sure is a sort of relevant description. Thanks a lot. Uh, more correcting, discursive social psychology. Oh, something like that. Not divisive, though, maybe sometimes. It couldn't be my writing. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me here to contribute that social science perspective. Um, uh, I've got a fairly broad social science background. Um, but mostly social psychology, as you say, and uh, with <coughs> enduring interest in behavior change. And um, is this picking up all right? Okay, I'll move in. Um, and uh, behavior change and persuasion, hence the rhetorical stuff I'm interested in. So um, I'll comment on the bit of the agenda that says, uh, that talks about behavioral economics and nudging. Um, obviously there's a lot to be said and we'll get into it. Okay, can you hear now? Okay, I'll lean right in. Um, at the moment, I'm working on uh, electricity consumer stuff as part of the Low Carbon London uh, a project, and I'll come back to that because it's a slightly different emphasis to the energy efficiency stuff that the Green Deal is talking about um, for the most part. But um, I'm not a behavioural e economist. And I don't, what, I, what I'm interested in is I wouldn't characterise as uh, nudging, but um, I am sympathetic to that approach in that it introduces more psychology into economics or reintroduces it more correctly. Um, for example, uh, the assum well, most of the assumption that e economists normally have about perfectly rational uh, actors, uh, maximizing costs and benefits, that sort of stuff, those assumptions have been criticized by the social sciences for a long time. And uh, it's good to see that um, uh, an approach within econo e economics that um, is taking psychology seriously, as economics used to do a long, long time ago. So it's um, it's, uh, it's going full circle, really. Uh, for example, just to make it a bit more concrete, one of the insights from behavioral econom economists is that the way people discount or uh, aren't persuaded as much by rewards that are distant, you know, they're, they're kind of motivated more by immediate gains, uh, which is irrational in some ways. And um, the Green Deal is sort of confronting that in some ways, that it's making the uh, upfront costs um, less of a problem and the longer term rewards more salient or, or uh, more attractive. Um, an another one is um, a company in, uh, in America, Opower, uh, this is electricity, um, who give feedback to uh, consumers um, on their consumption, but they compare it to uh, compar uh, comparative households in their neighborhood. So it's something called social proof, and uh, they consistently find about 3% reduction in, uh, in bills um, so that's, that would come under the sort of uh, behavioral economic stuff as well. Um, having said that, the, um, uh, I'm coming from the whole sort of uh, topic from the perspective of social psychology, so I'm interested in a wider range of social and human sort of considerations, and um, I'm a little ambivalent about nudging and behavioral economics. Um, one of the ways that um, well, both the strength and the weakness of, of the nudging approach is that it doesn't really promote conscious thought about the topic. And that's a, that's a strength because if you want to change behavior, you go for behavior change. And, um, you know, you, if you go for attitude change, it very often doesn't follow through um, into behavior change for various reasons. Um, people are quite inconsistent between their attitudes and their behaviors. But on the other hand, um, there's been, uh, you could certainly say that without that conscious sort of deliberation, nudging is going to deliver small little tweaks to behavior. It's not going to deliver radical, profound changes in lifestyle. So that's, um, that's uh, well, it's one of the reasons that policymakers like it, is because it doesn't necessarily get into the messy sort of debates about um, lifestyle values politics. But um, there's certainly been critics that, um, that want to see much more um, to confront those lifestyle and values and uh, the word aspiration has been mentioned as a, as a reason to um, be positive about people's uptake of the Green Deal and um, I'm sure that's the case. 
but at other times these aspirational values are exactly the problem um, that uh, means that spillover from one green behavior doesn't happen into other green behaviors so you get these tiny changes and um, with their power, 3% change in their bills adds up to an awful lot nationally. But on the other hand, it is only 3% change, and you know, we're looking at 80% reductions in the next um, few decades. So it's easy to um, be swayed by the kilowatt hours, if you like, but the percentage is important as well. Um, another, another reservation or limitation to the uh, nudging approach is that it is working at the level of sort of individual decision making. And um, that, again, is fine at times, but it, it, it's certainly a limitation as well. And then the Green Deal is um, looking at removing barriers to doing stuff which people couldn't otherwise do, which is good because uh, it confronts something called lock-in, which is that if you act on the individual level all the time, um, people just can't always, they're not free to do things differently. So um, it's good that um, the Green Deal is confronting um, what is possible for people to do. Um, but I'd actually say that that's not classic sort of no psychological nudging, that's removing a real financial barrier. Um, so um, just to kind of broaden the debate, I think, the, the fact that it, um, it's, not, it's not enough to talk about the individual and to sort of press the, give the responsibility uh, to the individual for changing um, their consumer practices um, means that you really need to look a bit more widely and integrate the social changes that you want to see, the, the consumer changes with technology and uh, regulation and that sort of stuff. So it's, it's got to be it's got to be part of a bigger bigger um, a bigger solution. Uh, and one final uh, thought um, before the questions that is that the Green Deal it's primarily I know it's including microgen and that sort of stuff, but primar primarily talking about efficiency <coughs> and reducing demand and conserving energies. But um, there's another, especially in the electricity area, uh, which is going to become increasingly important as heating and, and transport gets electrified in, in the future, is that there's um, another dimension, which is not only how much electricity you use, but when you use it. And uh, growing the the wind uh, power contribution to the energy mix is going to uh, be supported by um, encouraging people to use electricity at certain times, which sounds a bit scary, but you, it, it demand response is what the, uh, the industry call it. And that is, it can be generated quite predictably and, and reliably, and that is going to be really important. And uh, innovative tariffs and pricing signals, which is normally the economists' tools, and, uh, surprised to be supporting that. I think for energy it is a real, it has massive potential, but again you're going to have to tie in the tariffs for the consumers with the technology, in this case wind power and the regulation, so it's all got to be part of some complicated integrated uh, set of solutions rather than just saying, you know, you please, you know, I'm trying to encourage you to do things a bit differently. So. Um, Basically, that I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I'm again mildly encouraged by that. But we haven't had Guy yet, which now comes on. Um, Guy, I'm afraid, as he's heard me say before, is one of these people whose career has gone downhill. He, um, he started off in an honourable profession as a journalist, an honest, disintegrated seeker for truth, like myself and Charles and other people, if you were on that rig, never causing any trouble or trying to stir people up. Um, and has now ended up as a policy one, which is a very dull operation, really. But um, he's the head of the Environmental Energy Unit at Policy Exchange. But he does occasionally go back to his old profession. And I managed to produce an article for the, um, for the last Labour Party conference, but I rather unkindly unveiled them, which was headed something like um, why, um, why, why, why George Osborne is right about the environment, which I'm sure Greg would agree with, but we shall find out in a minute. But uh, and I promised in retrospect, in sort of compensation for that, to bring the article on to brandish at this conference as well. But as those who saw me rummaging through my papers may have seen, I've actually lost it. But anyway, there we are. He may have been booed by 80,000 people at the Olympics, but George has a friend, a guy. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jeffrey. Actually, I had a meeting with um, 
uh, an investor, an investor in renewables the other day, and he said, and this was his quote, he said, George Osborne is the best thing that's ever happened to the environment. Really? Which I suspect is not a sentiment that Greg hears in many meetings. Very, <laughs> very often. Yeah, uh, it's a genuine, genuine case. Um, well, thanks very much, Jeffrey, and thanks uh, all for, for coming along today. Um, I just want to make uh, two quick points today. Um, first, first of all, is to, to to make the wider point that energy efficiency and energy conservation is, is not an easy thing uh, to deliver. And secondly, that uh, the Green Deal um, uh, should be seen as a kind of wider suite of uh, policy measures. Um, on, the, on the first point about energy efficiency and uh, not being as straightforward as, as we all hope, Greg used the phrase, phrase no-brainer, and he's obviously using it in the sense that it's something we should be focusing on. It was a phrase used at the Labour Party conference, it was a phrase used at the, the, the Lib Dem conference. And there is a risk that we play into this idea that all this that it's, it's straightforward, and this has perhaps been part of the problem with energy efficiency policy for a long time. It's almost as if the, the market will deliver it by itself. Because the important point, and I think this goes to some of Richard was talking about, is that um, whilst one side of energy efficiency is the kind of technical side, the kind of rock wall uh, installations and all, all those measures, you're also crucially talking about people's um, behavior and how they use uh, energy in the home, and government traditionally has been pretty uncomfortable uh, with, with this idea. This is this is difficult stuff because you're talking. Um, Richard's got uh, much more technical language about what you're talking about. But you're talking about peer pressure. You're talking about habits, you're talking about attitudes and, and, and values, and these uh, these difficult things for government to change, and often very uncomfortable um, uh, talking about that, telling people what they should do. So. The, the first point I'd like to, to drive home is that energy efficiency is, is, is not easy, and the Green Deal as an effort to uh, get over some of those barriers is, is, is welcome, um, and uh, indeed policy exchange called for it uh, in, a, in a paper uh, several, several years ago. Um, will the Green Deal deliver the kind of savings that, that, uh, that, are, that are in the impact assessment and the, that Greg and everyone else hopes for? I, I think... Um, I think Greg's right to say there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's actually going to happen because it is a new mechanism and we should, be, we should celebrate that. The fact that um, there's going to be some experimentation and we're going to see uh, exactly what something like this will deliver. As you say, there are problems at the moment with giving away free insulation and how, how difficult that is. But I think that's why it's, it should always be seen in the context of the wider policy. That may involve questions about pricing, um, which is politically... Uh, very difficult. I don't think price alone is going to drive people to get more serious about energy efficiency and a, a carbon price on heat uh, may be part of the factor as long as you uh, protect, the, protect the poorest. Um, I think crucially, and the government's doing some interesting work in this area, is that you have to have, alongside measures like the Green Deal, you have to have um, incentives for demand reduction programs more widely, essentially energy companies to be crude despite their licenses, make more money by, by selling energy. So it's important that we get the incentives in, in place that they are rewarded for, for people using less energy. I know uh, some of the work on EMR is being looked at <coughs> on that issue. Um, we're considering a piece of work about whether you could incentivize uh, demand reduction programs through uh, eco. And obviously, smart meters is an opportunity um, makes the possibilities for innovation in that area. Uh, very exciting. That's the crucial point about this. Uh, innovation in the energy space is often talked about in terms of uh, new generating technologies, which are the new bits of kit which are, are going to be exciting. But innovation equally in terms of how we change people's behavior, improved uh, messages, how we can get people to compete against each other in terms of energy efficiency is equally important in terms of innovation. Um, and you want to set up market systems where the demand reduction programs and energy efficiency technical measures compete against new generation so that we're delivering the most cost-effective overall decarbonisation. And again, that is one of the most uh, important issues going forward. Um, in addition to pricing and, and getting the right uh, market incentives in place, there is also a role for regulation and what's going to happen with building standards and consequential improvements is going to be a key challenge for that. Always the balance is going to be is the regulation uh, in proportion, uh, which has not always been the case, uh, perhaps, in, in the past. And one minor issue I'll, I'll finish on, um, which is to do with uh, business awareness and measures to make businesses more aware of, uh, 
of energy efficiency opportunities. Um, we've been very critical of the, the CRC as a kind of very overcomplicated way of getting people interested in uh, energy efficiency. But some elements of the CRC, such as getting people to report uh, carbon, make sure makes sure that people at a senior level in organizations get it, that they realize that this is a, both a reputational risk and a financial risk. And so they start to take it more seriously and uh, get some of the, the cheaper cost savings, and importantly, the cheaper carbon savings um, that, will, that will help us meet some of our aggressive targets. Thank you, Guy. Well, it's been rather more upbeat on the Green Deal than the previous ones. I'm sure this is done to Graves' easy charm. Um, but it's also been shorter. Everyone has been much better disciplined. So we actually now have rather more than a quarter of an hour for questions. So um, I'm sure most of it's a great, but can be invited. It'll take several at a time. Lady over there first. Hello, Jenny Driscoll from Witch. Um, Guy talked about some of the habits, and I'd like to bring in some of the habits that we've seen from energy companies, at which particularly as soon as they set foot in someone's home, what we've seen in the past, for instance, say for example, solar panels, cavity wall insulation, even smart meters, is this kind of, you know, can't resist to sell other things and also miss sell other things as well. And so what are you gonna do in the, particularly the early days to make sure that consumers you know, don't lose out and that suppliers and energy companies don't see it as a bit of an opportunity to make money when it shouldn't be that opportunity. Thanks very much. Actually, a lady at the Liberal Party conference, did, or Liberal Democrats, they call themselves, did also raise the question of all this cold calling that people get and how that puts them off. Can I stop? Oh, can we do a step? All right, okay. Is that all right? The gentleman there? We do four or five, I think, there are uh, so many questions. David Ardling on in Gas UK. Uh, Whilst I wouldn't decry in any sense insulation and the benefits of the switch, none of you has mentioned switching out of old gas boilers into modern condensing boilers, which actually probably makes the quickest step change in people's bills than all other things. The second thing that has not been mentioned is the rebound effect, and that is the more energy efficient you are, the more resources you release and they tend to get used for other purposes which themselves are energy consuming. That's just human nature economics. The third one, quickly, for Richard, I wonder if he could explain the switch out of using petrol in our cars to diesel in our cars, which people seem to be doing readily. Cause of pollution. Right. Thank you. Um, Laura, can you just Yeah. Yes, Laura Sands, I'm a PPS to Greg Barker, but been very much involved in this sector for a long time. Um, one of the things, though, I think we're also missing, I think Guy's point about business is important, but could government not be doing more when it looks at its own property base and um, to actually start delivering some savings to the taxpayer, but also setting up sort of markets and, and developing new technologies in insulation that would be sort of, you know, product leaders? Oh, I didn't realise you were a PPS. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. That's true. Oh. I'm going to your next. But Anybody well, else that works for me in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Charles Bowman. Charles. Sorry, Sam. Yes. Yeah. Um, we always do. <laughs> um, this, this is the, without the microphone version. Um, Greg, can you just tell us what the conditionality is going to be on this? I, I, I think the conditionality hits both ways. I mean, did, will I have to have these horrible, horrible, horrible? Uh, LED lights, which I don't agree with Jeffrey about, which are as unesthetic as, as, as hell, if I'm going to get my other half of my loft insulated. Uh, is there going to be conditionality about this? Is that really a question of course, That's about the, the, uh, the, the conservatory tax? Or are you going to get any version of that through? Because as far as I can see, unless you do get some version of that through, we're not going to get any carbon savings out of this. Uh, and so then you're right in the back, and then we better take those five and hope we can get some more in. Thank you. And Jane Thomas, I'm from Friends of the Earth, and obviously not going to make any comments about um, Green's government ever, but I do really welcome this initiative. I was with the lead cabinet member for Sheffield City Council, who's leading on Green Deal, and he's really excited about it. There's just a couple of things um, that we remain concerned about. First of all, um, any changes to the planning regulations particularly the announcements that may be coming about loosening of planning and in particular that impact it may have on new builds and all the fantastic initiatives about greening new buildings. We really, really sort of urge to make sure that all that stuff stays. 
the second thing is just about being carbon literate, and I was quite interested about what Thomas was saying about people really needing to understand this. And I think there's a possibility that it's going to be really, really complicated for people. And Manchester are doing a really good program on carbon literacy, and I would like or hope that we encourage you to sort of look at that and see if that could be rolled out through councils. Fascinating. Sound to hear about Leeds. We were in the Labour Party conference. We had the leader of Southampton and said. I'm not touching the Green Deal because it sucks, so it's good to hear the other view. Greg, can we put you on quickly and yep. um, go down the panel and hope you can now load in? Firstly, the uh, lady who said that she's concerned that it will be seen as an opportunity to make money. Um, you bet, this is a fantastic opportunity to make money, um, and the fact that it will draw in far more participants, uh, SMEs, new entrants into the supply chains, uh, new high street names, supermarkets, uh, retailers who excel in consumer experience. That is the whole point. I do not want, this is not an East German style um, command and control insulation program. We've had that before, didn't work. Um, this is about liberating the market, but do not mistake the fact that this is a great opportunity to make money that will drive investment, drive innovation, drive new products, drive new offers that are tailored to specific customer needs in different parts of the country, in different um, sectors of society. Do not mistake that with a lack of strong safeguards for the consumer. There will be very, very, there is very, very robust consumer protection in place. First of all, it must, any Green Deal journey begins with an independent assessment of the needs of that individual household, that individual building. Um, and from that list, um, the consumer will be able to choose those interventions, those products, those technologies that they wish to go with. They may wish to go with the whole package, but to answer Charles's point, there will not be a conditionality that they have to have all or nothing at all. There will be the ability to pick and choose if they will, but we hope, obviously, most people will go for Green Deal Max. Certainly, if they want to take advantage of feed-in tariffs and other forms of government subsidy going forward, we expect there to be um, a minimum energy efficiency standard. Um, for example, on, on feed-in tariffs, it means a uh, EPCD or the, uh, in some buildings, for historic buildings where um, you can't meet that uh, D, um, that uh, you would uh, need to do all the sensible green dealable measures for that, for that building. But we do expect um, people to um, be part of a growing market, and a market means people making money, but that does not mean, that is not synonymous with people being hard sold or uh, cold called um, or, uh, or ripped off. We will put the strongest ever consumer protection in place, but we'll also have a fantastic market. Um, I didn't mention boilers, I didn't mention lots of other things. Um, there simply isn't time, but boilers are absolutely in there, as are 44 other different products. Um, of course, um, <coughs> switching to a condensing boiler is a strong energy efficiency saving measure. Um, um, we also hope that they won't just look to condensing boilers, but actually will look to take advantage from next year as part of the Green Deal assessment of uh, microgeneration as well as renewable heat, so heat technologies. So the Green Deal is more than just energy efficiency. And as the golden rule um, beds in, we, and the cost of other, other microgeneration or renewable heat technologies um, comes down and can meet the golden rule, we expect it to um, fund other things apart from energy efficiency. But um, even from day one, a Green Deal assessment will also advise um, households on potential for other technologies that don't meet the golden rule but may benefit from other government support programs like microgeneration solar on the roof or a CHP boiler or, 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 or ground source heat pumps or whatever. So they'll get that advice. Um, the rebound effect, um, of, sure, of course if you release um, savings and people have more money in their pockets as a result of the Green Deal, there will be some element that goes into other carbon producing um, um, activity. But if you look at California that, that historically had the most um, mm. radical um, uh, energy efficiency um, policies for two decades now, um, <coughs> you actually see that California has significantly less lower carbon footprint per head than other parts of the US, it doesn't necessarily just feed back into other carbon saving, uh, sorry, other carbon polluting activity. Um, and in terms of Laura's point, in terms of the government taking leadership in its own property portfolio, actually one of the things I'm proudest of, a real achievement that people can't uh, argue with, 
is the fact that unlike the Labour Party that was asked to sign up to the 1010 campaign in 2009 and consistently refused despite the campaign, the Conservatives followed by the Liberals did sign up to that and in government we delivered it. I personally oversaw that across government. I can see why the Labour Party didn't want to sign up to 1010 because there was huge resistance to it uh, in, in, the, in the machinery of government, um, lots of departments saying it couldn't be done. Well, actually, with political will and that political leadership and the will to do it came from the Prime Minister himself, personally lead, you know, instructing the Cabinet that they, this was not an option, that they actually had to enforce this in each and every department of Whitehall. As a result, we smashed the 10% target and re reduced our energy consumption by 13.5% in our first year of government. The Prime Minister then set a more ambitious target of 25, but I think there's more we can do. And actually, what I want to see is government leading on the uh, retrofit agenda of government buildings, public sector buildings, which are very jobs rich, which um, you know, will, be a, will be a huge boost for the construction sector. And I've got a live dialogue with the Treasury about that now. Um, hopefully we might be able to say something in the future. Um, I, think, um, I think that's it. Richard, do you want to say something? Sure. Um, I'll try and go through most of them. Um, the off, the um, question about um, suppliers sort of curl calling and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm working with um, EGF Energy on the Low Carbon London project, and I'm not an expert on off gems regulations, but we do hear quite a lot that, you know, they say, well, no, we sorry, we can't on the project, we can't do that, we can't talk about anything else when we're in there fitting the smart meter. and, and you know, we can't do cold calling, we're not allowed to do that anymore. So even for recruiting for the trial, they, they're, they're quite often saying that they're constrained in those ways, which uh, sounds like a, a good thing from the consumer uh, point of view. Um, that's all I can say about that, really. The, uh, the rebound effect and the diesel question. Um, I kind of alluded to the rebound effect when I was talking about the sort of um, nudging approach of not getting you to think about um, the topic too much and not challenging values. Um, because precisely that, that it's that, precisely that issue. If you go the, I mean, there's, there's been stuff by um, people like Tom Crompton at WWF on the common causes approach, and he's criticised the sort of uh, approach where you do incremental, tiny, little, easy changes and expect that it'll all add up to some, you know, bigger and bigger changes on a virtuous escalator. And um, the reason that you don't get the spillover into other behaviours and you do get rebound. Uh, is because you're not confronting that um, basic underlying motivation to do it for green reasons. You may be getting them to do something green because it, they're going to look cool and then of course it's going to rebound and they're going to use the money to go to Barcelona for the weekend or something. But um, I think the uh, solution maybe is to accept that uh, those nudges aren't the full solution and hopefully the other dirty areas of, of, of um, of consumption will be cleaned up at the same time, so there'll be greener travel options if people want to spend their money that they've saved, then uh, <coughs> the uh, the other damaging things they could do with it are going to be tackled at the same time. But yeah, it definitely is a, it definitely is a potential problem. Um, the diesel thing, I'm not an expert on diesel, but I am interested in transport, and I'm uh, one of the on the board of trustees for Car Plus, so I would obviously suggest car clubs as part of the solution for um, uh, <coughs> personal transport. And um, also um, electric vehicles, uh, the electrification of transport I kind of mentioned. There's a huge potential there for EVs, but it has to be linked to renewables. And fortunately, nighttime charging of EVs using smart charging has, has got a lot of potential. Um, so again, technology as Guy mentioned, coming in with behavior change and it's all kind of, that's, a, that's a, an optimistic solution for EVs. Um, I think that's about it on that. The new technology question, I kind of missed that. I don't think I can say much about it. Um, but the, the Friends of the Earth question about carbon literacy, I'm kind of ambivalent on that one. Um, I think it would need to be uh, yoked to incentive, well, offers of action. Like, I don't think there's much point in sort of educating people, especially when it's on the basis of carbon. I think money is much more meaningful for people, and that's not in a wildly cynical way. I just think it, it, a pound means more than a, a ton of CO2 for people. And um, although the education can, as like someone mentioned the word narrative earlier, it can it can send a powerful signal that you know there's values to be 
addressed here and there's government sort of will to act is you know visible if there's a di if there's a debate going on about carbon literacy i think you can also change norms through through money as well if a tariff is setting a certain price for a, a um, um, <clears throat> non-renewable electricity or there's any other price signal it becomes normalized that um, you will pay more for that and this policy has a real potential for uh, changing the sort of ethical codes and cultural expectancies in society so I think uh, just education is I'm a bit, a bit wary of it unless it's sort of follow, followed through with something they can do about it. Thank you Richard. Um, we're running out of time I'm under very strong instruction to to get this over by 12.15. Um, Guy, do you have anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say very quickly, one on the rebound effect from, from David. This is, and Greg mentioned the California example, this is why it's really important from a direct rebound point of view that you both deal with um, getting incentives for demand reduction alongside some of the uh, technical measures, because you need both of those. It's no good if we, uh, uh, if we insulate everyone's houses beautifully and then everyone decides to just you know, walk around in their underwear the whole time. That's, uh, that's not, if you're looking at carbon solutions, that's not the problem. Also, there's a role of carbon pricing in that, potentially, um, you're putting an increasing pressure on people. Again, that's politically difficult, but uh, if you're talking about economic solutions, that's, that's one of the way uh, to look forward. Um, and on Laura's point about the government uh, example, I'm glad Greg mentioned the 10%, because I think it's a hugely successful story. And it's also, if you're talking about uh, creating uh, peer pressure and social norms for businesses to actually do something about it, then if the government can put its house in order and say we cut by 12.5% and we're going to sustain that, we're going to increase it, then um, it's harder for businesses to say, well, why should we do anything? And finally, a word from our sponsor, Thomas, who's sat very patiently. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, this will be like it's not about energy efficiency or energy renewables. It's also not a, a question of boilers or insulation. It's a total house approach with the fabric the active components, the air tightness. So sorry for not discussing boilers today. Um, on conditionality, I, I fully agree it's a very good driver because when you're maintaining your building or you're operating your building, that is the right time to also do something about the energy efficiency. That's where you get absolutely most bang for the box. Uh, for Friends of the Earth, it is complicated, the energy agenda and the carbon agenda, and awareness is low. That's why campaigns would be such a great help and preferably government-led. And finally, on government buildings, I fully agree, it's a good place to start. It's done very successfully in other parts of the world. For instance, Malaysia, where I was stationed before, where the industry actually helped the local deck building the most energy efficient uh, office building in the country. Thank you, Thomas. We have one minute to go. I'm very sorry we will have to end it there. I've run a very strong three line bit this time. I usually try to let them run over, but I really have my... So, um, news just in, Jeffrey, just for those of you that aren't following George Osborne's speech on Twitter. Um, <laughs> 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 but apparently there'd been no mention, bad news, no, no mention of climate change. However, he has, news, he has said, rise in world oil price has been larger than anyone expected. And there's been one of the major reasons of I just try to find an excuse for cocking these up. But there we go. Anyway. Many thanks all. Thanks for coming. And um, see you again tomorrow. <laughs> 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 <laughs>